Earlier, I talked with one of the few politicians to take on America's two major parties and win. Jesse Venturi was elected governor of Minnesota in 1998 when he was a member of the Reform Party. He's now a TV personality and he's the author of American Conspiracies. Governor, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Nice to be here. When we look at the American political system, the two-party system appears to be entrenched in this country. But you were one of the few politicians who broke through that system. You won an election without running as a Democrat or a Republican. How difficult is it to get into a political race in the United States without belonging to one of these two big parties? It's extremely difficult. But first, let me make a correction. I'm not a politician. I'm a statesman. Here's the difference. A politician makes it his career. A statesman serves and then goes back to what he or she used to do. I'm a statesman. Anyway, it's very difficult because they have a stranglehold on the system and they don't like to let anyone else in. Uh, the last time we had three people in a presidential debate was way back in the 1992 with Ross Perot over 20 years ago. And so that's because the Democrats and Republicans control the whole system. It's like a two-party dictatorship. So what is it going to take to change that? Well, it takes educating the American people to the point that, you know, they don't have to vote for Democrats or Republicans. I don't. People often ask me, are you going to watch the Democratic debate tonight or are you going to watch the Republican debate? I go, no. Why would I? I'm not going to vote for any of their candidates. It's, it's, it's a matter of breaking this trend or this cycle where people think you have to vote for a Democrat or Republican. There's multiple candidates on there, but where it has to start, they have to start letting more people, more different parties into the final debates. And good luck on letting that happen. But do you believe that most Americans are of that opinion as well, that this country does need a third political party? I mean, what does the third political party bring to the table that the other two parties are not right now? Well, it brings my philosophy. I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially liberal. See, to be a Republican, you have to be fiscally conservative and socially conservative. To be a Democrat, you have to be uh, fiscally liberal and socially liberal. I'm one of each. Fiscally conservative, socially liberal. So how do I fit in? I don't. Well, if we look at the front runners for the two main parties right now, on the Democrat side, you have Hillary Clinton. On the other side, you have Donald Trump. Um, is it more of the same, or do they bring something different to this election? Well, Trump definitely brings something new. If you look on the Republican side, your three front runners have never held office before. So that clearly shows you that in the Republican Party, there's a faction of that party that is tired of the career politician and is looking for anything new. On the Democratic side, you got Bernie Sanders, who's actually an independent, who made a smart move to run as a Democrat because now he gets airtime, he gets TV time, and he's included in the debates, which you have to be. But Bernie's doing to the Democrats exactly what Donald's doing to the Republicans, and I'm cheering for it because I want these two parties fractured. I wrote a book a number of years ago called Democrips and Rebloodlicans, No More Gangs in Government. And uh, I love it that that's happening now. But isn't that the problem here, that you may be an individual with a viewpoint that is not consistent with those two main political parties, but the only way you're going to get that heard is to join them? Um, no, I did it without joining them. I became the governor of Minnesota, and everybody said I couldn't win. I won. Why? I was allowed to debate. If you let a third or fourth entity into the debates, you will see the Democrats and Republicans fall because they've been in charge of this country for 150 years. And look at the debt we're in today. A child born today is $50,000 in debt when they takes its first breath, and it won't work for another 18 years probably. Now imagine if they ran their home budgets like that. They'd be street people. They've been in charge. How do they run from it? They've created this mess. They're responsible for it. What about those people who are supporters of the two-party system who say, look, yes, we do have the two-party political system in the United States. It brings the United States stability, and it does accommodate a wide variety of political views. Really? 
Gee, I guess it gives you one more choice than a dictatorship, huh? <laughs> but, I mean, that is the argu argument that is made by those who support the two-party system. What, that they have one more choice than a dictatorship? That's not much. But the fact that... The You're system telling me all people can be bottled into these two parties? Baloney. You know, take a look at the voter turnout. The last national election in the United States, 64% of the people didn't vote. That's nearly two out of three. They've alienated that. That's shameful. They're all waiting out there for someone to come along who they can vote for. Well, if they're all waiting out there, why doesn't this country have a third party then? Because the two parties are in control and won't allow it. You can't get in the debates. They controlled, the last time they allowed was Ross Perot. Ross Perot ended up getting 20% of the vote in 92. He ran again in 96. Clinton and Dole made a deal. They, uh, Clinton, Dole wanted Perot out of the debates because he felt it would detract from his conservative stance. Clinton didn't want debates at all because he was so far in front. So those two cut a deal that there'd only be two debates that year and that they'd eliminate parole. Now, why should the Democratic and Republican candidates have the right to eliminate anybody else from the debates, especially in the case of parole, where the previous four years earlier he got one out of five votes? That's not good enough? How much of an impact does money have on the American political system? With the Democrats and Republicans, it's everything. We have a system today based completely on the concept of bribery. And in the private sector, if you commit bribery, you go to prison. In the public sector with the Democrats and Republicans, and now that they let corporations put <laughs> unbelievable amounts of money in, that's called fascism. And we're at the brink of it right now because corporations are controlling the government of the United States. I mean, we're looking at presidential politics right now with that race coming up next year. What about politics uh, in the other branches of government? Let's take Congress, for instance. If we look at the way Congress is performing right now, their effectiveness, it's gridlock. That's yeah, and there's, and there's no competition because the two parties make the districts so that <coughs> career politicians get reelected. They do districts according to, okay, these are all Republicans, that's a district. These are all Democrats. They don't make competitive districts. Maybe 25 of our 400 and some congressmen actually have to compete to get reelected. It's a scam, top to bottom. So if you had a candidate right now who steps into the ring and says, look, I want to stand as a third party candidate, is that a viable thing for someone to do right now at this stage of the race? Uh, depends on who that someone is. What about if it's you? Uh, if it's me, I'd be viable because for some reason I attract the press. And uh, the other reason is I've won. I've defeated the two parties not once but twice. Many people don't realize I was the mayor of the sixth largest city from 90 to 94 where both the Democrats and Republicans teamed up against me in a nonpartisan election, but I won anyway, 67 percent to 33 percent. And then, of course, when I went for governor, I defeated the two parties there. So uh, I could do it, and there are certain people that could get away, because the key is you have to have name recognition. Then you don't have to buy it. Most of these candidates have to buy name recognition. That's how come they have to accept all the briberies. Now, would you be um, open to the idea of, say, running with someone like Donald Trump? perhaps as the... Only out of respect to him. Right. Uh, Donald's been a friend of mine for 25 years, and if he were to ask me, I would give it its consideration because I respect the man. I wouldn't say I would do it right now, but I would certainly consider it. I would do the same with Bernie Sanders uh, if he asked me. But anybody else in the Democrats or Republicans, uh -uh. wouldn't even consider them. What do you think are the major issues right now that are not being addressed by these two main political parties in this election campaign? Um, the, just about every issue they're not addressing. It's turned into a circus show and it's turned into... I'll put it to you this way. I think we need to pass a law that doesn't even allow you to form a campaign committee until the year of the election. 
All of this is being done for entertainment and money for the media. Why should we, why should an elect, what's going to happen when the new president takes office in January of 2017? Is that when the campaign will start for 2020 at that point? That's what it's getting to now. It's ridiculous. They shouldn't even allow it to happen until the year the election is going to take place.